8 verses this evening. 2 Timothy chapter 4. As a piggyback from last week, as you're turning over there, uh, we were talking about the Bible version debate and about the scriptures and all scriptures. A lot of people want to say with that that uh, King James is hard to read. It's hard to understand. It's hard to understand all those big words. Well, I have a simple solution for that. If you're a digital user and you like using things digitally, all you simply got to do, I know if you have an Apple phone or an, or an iPad, there's this app called eSort, and it can tell you definitions. You just got to push a button. So um, you're struggling with a word, uh, there's that. If you prefer the hardcover, there was a guy a while ago named James Strong, and he made this nice, big, thick concordance to give you every single word broken down, the Greek that comes behind and the meaning behind it. So there are ways to understand the King James Bible if you feel like you cannot understand it. And if these folks didn't go through all that time and effort to help us understand that, then, I mean, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, so don't take this as true fact, I don't know many concordances for most of the newer translations. Again, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, there's not really a lot of those, but there is good resources on the King James Bible for, for good reason. I think because it's the most accurate translation. So, it just saw that. So that's all from last week. So we examined the purpose of the scriptures and what version of God's word is the most reliable one to read. Now tonight, in the first eight verses, we will examine a charge that Paul gives to Timothy as Paul nears the end of his life. Tonight, we will examine that charge and Paul's mindset as he nears the end of his life. Second Timothy is known as Paul's swan song. Why? Because this was the last book that Paul had written, wrote, before the end of his life. And we're going to look a little bit at how that occurred today and next week uh, through some church history. But sometimes when you get to the end of your life, you kind of, most people that I know want to be able to set the next generation better than when than when they had been here. More, let me let me rephrase that a little better. A lot of people when they get to the end of their life, they want to leave it better than when they came. And they get the next generation prepared and thus this and that. And that's what we're looking at really here tonight and today and next Sunday is Paul is trying to remind Timothy this is what you should do. You want to continue, you want to do the things that are right, this is how you do it. So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, and then we'll pray and then we'll look at the first eight verses. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1. I charge thee before, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And then we'll look at the first three words of verse 2. Preach the word. This evening, I'd like to submit to you that all people need to hear the gospel message. A charge to read all people, what is it? It's to preach the gospel. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in these first eight verses here tonight. Let's pray and then we'll continue further. Father, help us as we look into your word. Help us as we look here for the next few minutes here. Help us to be able to cast aside the things that are on our minds that might the things that we might be thinking of deadlines do appointments do and different things like that and that just for the minutes that we were here that we can focus solely onto your word that we can grow we can understand we can be encouraged convicted where need be and father i pray that you would help me as i preach that you just help it to be clear help it to be plain and help it to be simple but most importantly that what you've given tonight, that it can fall on good ground. And we ask these things here in Jesus' name. Amen. Those, those here live, those watching by way of video, Paul is going to really emphasize here tonight the fact that we need to reach lost people. And how so? And he's going to give some descriptions that will probably even makes sense in the time period that we are in now. This was written around AD 65, AD 67, again, near the end of Paul's life here. 
So verse number one through four, we see, first of all, the charge to preach, the charge to give out the gospel. Verse one says this, I charge thee. Well, who wrote the book? Paul. I charge thee. Who has he been referring to mostly the entire time? Peter. Yes, it sounds like I'm going into junior church mode. Okay, follow me quickly, all right? I charge thee, therefore, before God. Now, that is an interesting phrasing all in itself. He charges. He protests earnestly. He attends. He testifies. And he witnesses. So what is he trying to charge Timothy? I charge thee, therefore. Therefore, because of what? All the stuff that had happened in the previous verses. From a child that has learned the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. All, inspir- all, God, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All these things that has been built upon. I want you to, you notice in the Bible how the Bible builds upon a certain foundation, a certain truth. And that's really what this all does. What has, what has happened here, especially in this epistle, is he started off with being strong in the faith, unfeigned love, don't let the fire burn, saying, hey, there's some things that are going to happen. There's other things that are going to occur. You should do this. And he kind of builds it all together to give a nice summary of what's going to, really what the thrust of the message is all about. And the Bible here just ni- ni- nice and neatly just puts it all together. And it's a building block. It's a foundation. and helps us to understand exactly what the message is entailed. So he says in verse 1, I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say? Who shall judge? Now, now here's here he's describing Jesus Christ here. Who shall judge the quick? Now, this is not really fast people. It's not the definition behind here. The behind the definition here is those who are living. Jesus is going to judge you and I. Yeah, that's what your Bible says. She shall judge the quick and the dead. That's self-explanatory. Those who died. When? And the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. What's that referring to? When Jesus comes again. There's a judgment day coming for those who are alive, those who are dead. Most importantly, those who are alive spiritually and those who are dead spiritually. So what is this charge that he gives to him? Oh, by the way, the word appearing here has this, the Greek word behind it is, I had this, let me say this again, epiphania, or think of an epiphany. Okay, that's where kind of you get that English word. What does it mean? A glorified appearance or a manifestation. Jesus is going to come. He is. It's not maybe so. The term we use and pastors use is this term called imminent. Where Jesus is coming. We just don't know when. You know, it's a good thing that we don't know when. Because if we knew when, we'd probably, as human beings, would slack off until it got closer. Could you imagine when you knew the day you were going to die? And you're like, okay, I have until I'm 73 years, 6 months, and 12 days. That's pretty precise. But if you knew you had that long to live... I mean, there may be things that you would do, but there will also be things that maybe you'd push off. And I'm glad that I don't know the time that I'm going to die. Hopefully it's not tonight. Hopefully it's not right now. That would be a little shocking. But if it's God's will, it would happen. All right? But what is he trying to tell us to do? Here's what he's telling us to do. Verse 2. Preach the word. Now, he is pre- he is, now let's put context here first, but then we're going to apply it. Context is that Paul is telling Timothy preach the word. Why? Paul was a pa- Timothy was a pastor. He was a pastor at the church at Ephesus. And so he told Timothy preach the word. Preach to herald, to herald divine truth, to proclaim. You need to preach. You need to tell people the word. And notice the other thing here too, be instant in season. That's in that's interesting and important to know we need to be on standby always to share the gospel of jesus christ now he's telling timothy as a pastor you need to be always ready to be equipped to share the gospel with somebody you never know when it's going to happen okay but 
Notice that the phrasing here, be instant, in season, out of season. Now, when opportunities arise, share the word. When opportunities lack, go find them. When there can be hindrances or embarrassments, not confined to just in church. Some people want to say, oh, only time you need to share the gospel is when you're at the pulpit and you're preaching. Well, how many people are preaching right now? One. How many Christians are there? More than one. Most of you, if not all of you. All right? But I am a woman. The Bible's telling you to preach the word, telling you to proclaim the word to all people. That's the application. It's not just the pastor, preacher, whoever it is to say the word. It's you and I. It's everybody. We need to go out and we need to reach all people. In season and out of season. That's the application. He's telling Timothy in the context, you need to be ready to preach. But in the application to you and I, we need to be always ready to share the gospel. No matter when that time comes. It says in season, out of season. Now, let's get back into the verse here. Reprove. Reprove is to tell a fault or to admonish. I'm going to say this lightly here, but I kind of find it funny how people get offended sometimes when the pastor preaches something they don't like. What do I mean by that? Well, it's in the Bible, but it's something that they don't want to hear. But what is the pastor supposed to do? Preach, right? Preach what? The whole counsel of God. Does it mean sometimes stepping on your toes? Absolutely. Reproving here means to tell a fault. The hardest thing for pastors to, that need to do is to tell someone who's living in sin to stop it. It is. You think we enjoy coming up here and saying, you need to repent because you're wrong. No. If that was the case, then you're in the wrong profession. Okay? Let me go be a manager at a store and tell people that they're horrible. I've seen that quite a bit. Okay? And people degrade them. But here, a part of the counsel of God, if it's something in a hot toppy, in a, in a touchy subject, that the Bible says don't do this, we don't need to do it. But yet, sadly, people get all up in arms and offended, and they get this whole, oh, he's after me. He's preaching after me because he knows I did something wrong because we had that session that we had, and he's just trying to target me. Notice what you're. The Bible is just trying to tell you this is what you need to stop to do. And it could be because someone else in the church who you don't know is going through the same issue or the same problem. But, of course, they didn't say anything because it's not needed. But they know between them and God there's something that needs to be fixed. So reprove. Rebuke. Rebuking has this idea to forbid. A lot of people don't like to be told no. Just, just go outside and go into different places. You've seen it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. Rebuke. People don't like to be told to say no. Don't like to be told what to do at times. Now, exhort. People say, oh, pastors, all I do is try to tell people they're wrong. No, 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 no. They exhort. They invite. They beseech. They comfort with all patience. The Greek word behind exhort is parakaleo, where if you're familiar with some of these, paraclete is the Holy Spirit which comes alongside of you. The preacher is supposed to come alongside of you to help you, even though you're maybe doing something that's against the Bible, to help you to be able to change that through what God has spoken to him and to be able to encourage you, hey, even though you're doing this wrong, you can stop it. You can correct that. Exhort with all long suffering, patience. Sometimes we don't have the patience. We have the fast food mentality. Oh, we gotta get this quick done right here, right now. We, oh man, church isn't growing. Oh man, man we gotta go. We gotta go find some new program. We gotta bring a drum set in the church. We gotta change up all the worship style just because people don't like the old fashioned music and gospel. Bible's never changed for how many years? I mean, people are trying to change the Bible today, and we saw that last week. But the, Bible, the, the biblical message is clear and plain. Preach, reach all people, let the Holy Spirit do the work. Exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. 
Now I want you to notice, now you won't see it necessarily here in the, in the text, but you can kind of indicate it because of the charge that Timothy said, I charge thee to preach the gospel, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke. All of these in the Greek are imperatives. They are commands. And the idea behind that is sometimes as a pastor, as a preacher, there are topics that need to be preached on. No one in their right mind enjoys preaching on hell. Right? No one does. Okay? But there is a difference between preaching hard and preaching a hobby horse preaching. What do I mean by that? There are some pastors out there today who just want to stay on a certain two or three topics and they just want to hammer those home. It's, doesn't the Bible cover a whole bunch of other things? It does. But there are some who want to just stay in the one home or two home and they don't want to go through the whole council because they don't want to offend anybody. That's what you have with most of these seeker-friendly churches today. Many people get offended when a pastor preaches a certain topic. There are two uh, main. There are two topics that really stir a lot of people up. It's the topic of music. It's the topic of divorce and remarriage and, and different things like that. There's some certain hot button issues today with abortion and with all these other things that are popping up. The homosexuality movement. That people are like, oh no, you better not preach. And if you are, you better be careful when we should be preaching what the Bible says. And it's a sin to do those things. Amen. And yet people want to say, oh no, 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 no. We're going to step back from that. We, we don't want to be classified. Well, are you, preach, are you proclaiming the word then? No. Preaching is to rebuke and correct. One is preaching just because it's the only topic they know to preach upon. I, I've, I went to, when I went to Connecticut a few years ago, two years ago, we, I went to a church, and um, the pastor wasn't located in that church. He was located in Atlanta. We were in Connecticut. Connecticut, uh, Waterbury, and... And Atlanta is a little bit of a distance between each other. Just a little bit, okay? And so we had to worship and, yeah, worship. Now, ironically, this church was set in a movie theater and the spotlights were here. I'll tell you this. When, when the pastor came up to preach, that's what he, I guess he was doing, I couldn't even see my Bible. I was the only one in that church who brought their Bible that day. Because what do I like to look at? This. Being a Berean, studying and seeing what's coming up. But I couldn't see it. Interesting. A church that you can't even see your own Bible because it's too dark in the auditorium. I'm, can, can you see your Bible right now? Okay. I'm glad. I'm glad all the 84 lights in here work except for the three bulbs I've burned out right now. Okay? I know. I counted them because we had to change them all out. Okay, I'm glad all of them work. But it is good to know that you need to be able to see the Word of God. They're, they're four by six. You can do the math, okay? If you really want to figure it out. It's 80 lights in the chandeliers, okay? But he says, preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, repu reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Why? Verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Now the idea of endure here, or sound, means healthful or uncorrupt. There will be doctrine that will be unhealthy for you. Uses a, a, meta, a health term there, sound. There are people who are going to give you an unhealthy doctrine. Something that's going to, we, we hear about it all the time. And I hear about it because I have this great love for um, fast food at times. And it's bad for you. I know that. But it tastes so good. It's unhealthy. All right. Fruits and vegetables, I'll eat them. But that's not my first choice. Okay. I'm going to tell you that flat out. I like myself a good fried chicken. Actually, more grilled chicken more lately. Give me a pizza. I'm in heaven all day. Lasagna. You got me at lasagna. 
okay? Those are foods that I like, okay? But the idea here behind this sound here is you need doctrine that's going to help you, give you good health spiritually. You don't need doctrine that's going to make you unhealthy spiritually because it's going to turn your heart away from God. So for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But, now I want you to notice the phrase here. So they won't, there will be a time that comes when people won't want to hear about true doctrine. But after their own lusts. That's an important phrase throughout this whole section here. Because of their lust, because of their desires to do what they feel is right in their eyes, what are they going to do? They are going to heap unto themselves teachers having itching ears. Heap has this idea to accumulate further, to seek additionally. Instead of just going to the Word of God, they're going to trust the Word of somebody else instead of the Word of God. And if that person tells them something that they want to hear, guess what they're going to do? They're going to attach themselves to that person instead of hearing what the Word of God has to say. They're going to heap unto themselves teachers heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears to scratch or, or tickle, make them feel good. You know what's a dog whenever they go and they scratch and they feel good for a while, but then that itch comes again, they scratch it off again. That's the idea here, is that eventually they'll feel good for a while, but then it's going to come an itch and they got to try to find it again. Why? Because they're trying to seek something that's not of God instead of being calm completely. So, the, there's no period there. The thought continues, verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. Who's going to turn them away? The teachers. They themselves, they heap to themselves. Teachers having itching ears, they will turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Turns to myths untruths they go into apostasy from the truth so the first charge that paul has for timothy and for you and i is to reach and teach the gospel to preach why because there are people who don't want to hear it so they need to hear it even more so secondly verse five is a charge <clears throat> to be watchful timothy is told to share the word but there will come a time in which people will not listen but now there's another charge, a charge to be watchful. Verse number five. But watch thou in all things. It's an interesting thing. To be aware. Now, I, granted, I don't probably watch the news and I don't really watch trends as much as I probably should. All right. But there are things that pop up that you wonder how did that come about? Why is this coming? Why is this trend taking place? Paul is telling Timothy, watch out. Be aware of what's going on in the world. Watch thou in all things. The next thing is this. Endure afflictions. Paul wants Timothy to be faithful in their call to ministry to be discreet is really this idea to watch out in all things. Backing up a little bit. People will have an eye on all things you do. Be sure that what you're doing is Christ-like. People are going to keep an eye on what you do. And if it's Christ-like, hopefully I'll draw them to Christ. But if you do things that turn people away from Christ, then why they want to trust Christ? Watch out in all things. Now moving on. Endure afflictions. Undergo hardships. Second Timothy 2.3, we looked at that uh, a few weeks ago. It says this, Thou therefore endure hardness. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Christian life isn't going to come without some struggles along the road. You go to some other churches, they're just going to tell you, hey, your best life now is to do this. Okay. There are times when you struggle. There are times when you're going to go through some hardships. I like to be active. When I sprained my ankle out here, about 11 years ago for the first time I wanted to have fun with the kids we wanted to do the running long jump and so my partner jumped for a camp counselor he jumped 13 feet 10 inches I'm like I can beat that it's 22 smart person that I was I go run out 
and I run out, go charge out. I made it to 14 feet, three inches, and heard a pop in my ankle. And of course, smart me was like, oh no, this is fine. It's going to wear off. It's going to be perfectly fine. I go walking around. The next activity, we play a game, and I'm literally dragging my foot. I'm like, let's go play this game. I know I'm out of camera right now. Let's go play this game right now. And then it gets to pool time, and now I'm really moving like a turtle on the deck. I'm like, don't jump in the shallow way. And I feel like I... The turtle trying to beat the hare, and the hare's already made it around the lap five, five times in a row. Obviously, there was something wrong. Okay? But sometimes afflictions will occur. I had to eventually go into a brace and have crutches, and people had to help me pick up things, which is not normal for me because I don't like to have people do things for me a lot of times. Probably why I'm stubborn, but it's okay. But sometimes there will be afflictions that will occur. In the, in, in the Christian life. Endure afflictions. That's why he doesn't say sometimes the, uh, afflictions come. He says endure. Persevere. Make it through it. Next phrase. Do the work of an evangelist. All should do the work of proclaiming the gospel. It doesn't just stop at the church house. It goes everywhere through the world house. What does an evangelist do? Reaches and teaches the gospel. We know of as a guy who comes in does revival meetings, he preaches, people make decisions, and he goes off to another church. Well, we have the work to do even around here, to do the work of the evangelist. And, again, this is, we're looking at context and application, make full proof of that ministry. Accomplish the goals of your ministry. Bring the, the ministry to its fullest potential, is what Paul's telling Timothy. Reach, make the ministry max out to its greatest capacity. Even then, there's still other things that you can do. There are things that are in this ministry that haven't been maxed out yet. There are things that we can even enhance even more. It's up to us to make that happen through the Lord's help. So first thing is a charge to preach the gospel, to reach all people. Secondly is a charge to be watchful. Timothy is charged to be watchful in all things. But finally... We will look at what a fulfilled life is when serving the Lord. And that's in verses 6 to 8. A life found faithful. Paul now starts to change the message of this book to now more of a goodbye. And we'll look at more of that next week. But we're only going to look at the first three verses of this conclusion here. Paul begins to conclude the book here with the words that people would normally say at the end of their time on earth. These would be the last words that Paul would write before his martyrdom in Rome around A.D. 67 by beheading. He was ready to be offered up for the service of his Lord. Look at verse number 6. For I am ready to be offered. He was ready to go. I mean, what had Paul gone through? Just go to, I believe it's 1st, 1st 2 Corinthians chapter 11. All the things that he went through, starting at verse 23, going all the way down to the end of the chapter here. He went through many things, stoned multiple times, all these things, shipwrecked. Paul went through all those things, but he basically said, I don't want anything better. I wouldn't want to change my life one way. And he says, for now I'm ready to be offered, <clears throat> and the time of my departure is at hand. He knew it was getting close for him to go. Now, Paul's death would be the one of the first ones under the Roman emperors, but there would be ten major waves of Roman persecution on Christians. The first one was started by Nero, and he was a he was an interesting guy to say the least throughout history. He was a man who uh, had his wife and his mother killed and burned in Rome. Then he blamed the burning on the Christians and tried to turn people against Christians. Politics had its finest work, turning people against people. And many things happened. Paul was beheaded during this time frame. Nero was a very unstable man himself, but it didn't end there. A second persecution occurred under Domitian, who was known for cruelty, killed his own brother, and then brought up another persecution. During this time frame, the Apostle John was boiled alive. 
and then sent off to Patmos. Domitian made a law that no Christian once brought before the tribunal should be exempt from punishment without renouncing his religion. So basically, if you didn't say, I don't follow Jesus Christ, you're dead. Timothy also died during this time frame. The third persecution wave was under Trajan. He was, um, he, he was putting thousands of Christians to death daily. I mean, there's nothing that these people didn't do anything wrong against the law. He just wanted to do it. Sad. Ignatius was killed and other people. Then another persecution wave came under Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius persecuted Christians for fear they would destroy the state. They figured, oh no, these guys are going to come along and they're going to destroy all of us. And one of the people he got rid of was a man named Polycarp who trained under the Apostle John. Same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John Revelation. Someone like Paul to Timothy. This was Polycarp to John. He, he was uh, killed under this regime. But even when he was burned at the stake, the fire surrounded him like an ark. It didn't even touch him. Upon seeing this, the executioner was ordered to pierce him with a sword. And his blood uh, extinguished the flames. Pretty interesting there. But fifth persecution came under Severus. He was a guy who got sick, but then uh, he had a prejudice because he thought that, oh no, the other people aren't going to like me because I'm treating the Christians well. Let's just get rid of them too. So he did that. Sixth one was under Maximus. Numberless Christians were slain without trial, buried indiscriminately. Her seventh one was under a man named uh, Decius. This persecution was brought upon because of Decius' hatred for his predecessor, Philip, a Christian, and partly by his jealousy concerning the amazing increase of Christianity. Basically, because they were Christians were thriving, he said, oh, let's put an end to this. He had a hatred for it. During this time, error crept into the church. Not surprising. Why? Because there are people who thought, why are they going after us? eighth one was under Valerian. This one was a terrible one. Carthage, a plague broke out. And blame was placed on Christians because of this plague. And because of that, they just wanted to keep on going. Keep on trying to get rid of them. Keep on trying to get rid of the Christians. Ninth one comes under Aurelian. And here's something that was interesting, too. And I remember this had been a while but this was brought back to me is they had a legion of soldiers under this emperor here consisting of 600 6,666 men they were all Christians and they were called the Theban region named from the place they were raised they were ordered to march over the Alps Alps into Gaul into Gaul the Emperor Maximilian ordered a general sacrifice in which the whole army was to assist they were to take an oath of allegiance and swear at the same time to assist in the, term, in the extermination of Christians in Gaul. In hearing this, the whole legion refused to sacrifice or take the oath. So the emperor was so enraged that he ordered every tenth soldier to be killed in front of the legion. And then they thought, oh yeah, this, these 6,666 Christians, they're going to stop after we start getting rid of some of them. No, didn't happen. That whole army was basically taken out under this emperor, Aurelian. Then one of the worst ones was under Diocletian, the last emperor under the persecution of Christians, 8292 to 304. Churches were destroyed, scriptures were burned. Christians of position would lose their honor. Basically, they'd lose their positions just because they were Christians. Many different things occurred under this this guy here. Christian leaders were not sacrificed, would be thrown into prison, cruel tortures, Christians everywhere would sacrifice on threat of being put to death in a war of extermination. All this stuff was going on after Paul had passed away. But here's what he said throughout it all. He said, 
I'm ready to be offered. Verse 6. And the time of my departure is at hand. We don't know when that time is going to come for you and I. But it's going to come. But hopefully this is the phrase I can say yours in my life. Verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. Finished my course. I have kept. Notice the phrase here. The faith. The one true faith. Not some false faith. I kept the faith. Paul had won many spiritual battles before God. He completed life's race. I think of the song, Were Not for Grace. And now the song just faded away from my head. Were it not for grace, I can tell you where I've been, wandering down some pointless road to somewhere with my, if my salvation's up to me. I'm going to look it up because I can't even remember it right now. But it's a, it's a really good song. It's the good words we've sang it here for special music a few times. But it has an important meaning here. I'm going to look it up. There it is. It says, Time measured out my days, the verse. Life carried me along. In my soul I yearned to follow God, but knew I'd never be so strong. I looked hard at this world to learn how heaven could be gained. Just to end where I began, where human effort is all in vain. Verse 2, So here is all my praise, expressed with all my heart, offered to a friend who took my place and ran a course I could not start. And when he saw in full just how much his love would cost, he still went the final mile between me and heaven, so I would not be lost. The chorus, were not for grace. I can tell you where I'd be, wandering down some pointless road to nowhere with my salvation up to me. I know how that would go, the battles I would face, forever running, but losing the race, were it not for grace. If it was up to us, it'd be a pointless battle. It would be. It says, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Verse number 8, and will be done. Henceforth, continuing on the thoughts from 6 and 7, henceforth is there laid up for me a crown of righteousness. One of five crowns that the Bible mentions that can be achieved by a Christian. Crown of righteousness. <clears throat> Those who are faithfully following God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, that judgment seat, that bema seat, and not to me only, but also all them also that love his appearing. What's the crown of righteousness? For those who love his appearing, those who are faithful unto him. That's a crown that you and I can get, which we will then cast at Jesus' feet. What greater price can we get? Paul earnestly knew he wanted to see Jesus come, but he was content to die in the manner he did, to see the gospel be spread throughout. Paul, here in conclusion, gives us a charge to share the word of God and to be watchful in all things. But he reassures us that our labor on this earth will not be in vain for those who keep the faith. Life will bring us hardships and struggles, but we must press on and run the race until the race of life is over. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run the race, run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We must run the race. Continue on until that last breath has been given. That's what Paul gives to us, a charge to reach all people and to know that when we do that faithfully, it will be a life well worth it. Father, help us as we uh, look at as we've looked at your word here this evening. I pray that you would help us to understand what's been given. Father, I pray that you would just help us to 
examine ourselves, see that, see if whether we have, are active in sharing your word that we can, that we need to share your word, that we know it's a prominent thing, and that if we fall short of that, that you'd help us and encourage us to do that. Help us to be watchful in all things. Help us understand that there are times where persecution will come, afflictions come, but ultimately, when all that's said and over, we can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Father, bless and move as we go into the invitation time here. Those who you're working on, that you'd help us to pray to you and help us to, to continue our walk better with Jesus here. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a hymn this evening. If God's spoken to your heart, perhaps he has. Perhaps he's spoken to you about service and faithfulness. These are the things we heard about tonight, about being a faithful witness, about living the life that comes to the point where you could say, I am now ready to be offered up. So much there that's for us. Maybe the Lord's used it to speak to you. Perhaps the Lord's spoken to you about something else. Maybe not anything Brother Chris mentioned tonight, but you know.